privilege of introducing to you our speaker for this morning. 26 years ago, when I came to Kalamazoo, there were a number of pastors that reached out to me, and I'm indebted for their helping me to get acclimated to the Kalamazoo community. I remember Joe Brooks and Pastor Felton, Addis Moore, others were so generous to help me and to give me a welcome. I'm also appreciative of a real close friendship that I was able to have then and still have now with Pastor Steve Johnson and Pastor Dana Arledge, Bethel Baptist Church. What's, what's so amazing, uh, these men have come to a place of retirement in ministry. Pastor Johnson, I believe June 2nd, uh, will end 32 years of ministry. Okay. And then on June the 9th, Pastor Arledge will end 30 years of ministry at Bethel Baptist Church. And, but the call of God on a life is quite unique because in the tradition of the prophets, not so much in telling forth the future, but in foretelling what God has already given to us in his word, not adding to it and not taking away God has commanded us to feed the sheep, and to feed the sheep the word of God. And so I am so thankful. Also, uh, when I was working on my graduate degree, uh, particularly in expositional preaching, I needed to have a, a pastor who would be able to hear the sermons and look at the sermons as they were submitted. And so Pastor Steve Johnson would come over here to Bible Baptist Church, and he would have to hear my preaching. And uh, we sat in the classroom, and uh, then uh, he would make the marks, whatever, and he sent them in. I don't know what he, he put on the paper. He didn't show it to me, but uh, of course I did graduate, so I'm, 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 I'm thankful for whatever, he, whatever, whatever marks that he did give me, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative. Pastor Johnson came to Oakwood Bible Church in 1987 as the associate pastor. He was named senior pastor in 1990. He's a graduate of Grand Rapids School of the Bible and Music, holds a bachelor's degree from Cornerstone University, a master's degree from Moody Bible Institute. Steve's hometown is Fremont, Michigan. He and his wife, Beth, we're married June 13, 1975. They have two grown daughters and seven grandchildren. Would you join me and help me in welcoming the man of God, our speaker for the hour, Pastor Steve Johnson. Love you, thank you. Love you. I feel more important than I really am now. <laughs> well, I, I truly, and I say this, uh, not just blowing smoke here, but to, to have this honor to come and speak to you folks today is, is truly a joy and a blessing for me. And uh, I've gotten to know, uh, as you know, uh, Pastor Lavender through the years. And, uh, you know, we're busy in ministry, so we don't always get the opportunity to have fellowship that we'd like to have as often as we'd like to. But uh, just to know that, that we're there uh, for encouragement and so on. In fact, uh, when my oldest daughter was uh, engaged to be married, I asked Pastor Lavender if he would take them through the premarital counseling because I figured they would listen to him better than they would listen to me. <laughs> well, you did a good job, Kevin. Uh, there, I think, what's it been, 18, 19 years maybe? But uh, they've got four kids, uh, two of them in high school right now. Next year, they'll have a third in high school. Their oldest will be a senior. Um, little Isabel, she's still uh, homeschooled yet for a little while. But uh, they're doing real great, active in their church uh, up in Byron Center. 
And we have another daughter. She has three boys over in St. Joe. They're active in their church over there. So we have been blessed through the years, and uh, I know you have been blessed, uh, which is obvious uh, through uh, pastor's ministry. 51 years and two pastors, is that what I understand? That is awesome. That is just amazing. Uh, people often ask me, what, uh, you know, how do you stay in a church so long, you know, 30, 32 years? And my answer has always been, well, nobody else wanted me, and Oakwood didn't know what to do with me, so here I am. But, uh, well, they'll, they'll be relieved of that uh, dilemma uh, soon. But uh, God has blessed, uh, has blessed me and blessed my family as well. Well, I, I do congratulate you as a church on uh, not only Pastor Lavender's uh, anniversary, but your church, uh, 51 years of ministry here in community and the way you've grown and the way you've left an impact here. Um, I love this building, I tell you. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to run down a road of jealousy if I go any further than that, but uh, I, I'm so thankful that uh, you have this wonderful facility. Well, we need to turn our attention to the Word of God, so I'm taking you to Third John, the passage that uh, you read earlier. Now, uh, just to throw you a curve, I'm, I'm speaking from the New American Standard uh, Bible. Um, so if you're carrying a King James, New King James, or ESV, or a CBM, or a H2O, or whatever version you have, I don't know, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll be able to follow each other. But before I get to that passage, I just want to say, you know, uh, I, I think you would agree with me, if you've been in different churches, most of you, I hope, have been in this church uh, for the good share of your time, but... I might agree with me that every church has its characters. Now, by characters, I'm talking about the way certain people stand out because of their personality or their behavior or their idiosyncrasies. Um, you know, people can be peculiar. They can be interesting. They can be pleasant. They can be annoying. They can be odd. Uh, now, I think I would su probably say you folks here are normal. Um, I, I, you know, I spent the first 32 years of my life in my home church uh, back in Fremont, uh, where I was born and raised. I didn't go into ministry until I was, uh, I guess, 33, 34 years old. Uh, I was a police officer before that, just so you know um, why I'm a little strange sometimes. Uh, but I uh, spent the past 33 years here in Kalamazoo, with the exception of 16 months. Uh, as you know, they've all been at Oakwood Bible Church. But in all the years that I've been in church, from growing up and, and visiting churches and, and being a pastor of a church, I know that I've encountered, I think, just about every kind of character there is from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, some people just very, very lovable and uh, just a joy to be with. Some people that are a little strange. Uh, I've, I've ministered to people who are just plain odd. But I don't know what it is about the church that attracts weird people, but it does. Now, I don't think that's the case here, but uh, if, if you are weird, Jesus loves you, <laughs> just the same, just, just so you know that. Well, with that in mind, I want to turn our attention to 3 John here, and this is a very short personal letter. Chuck Swindoll calls it a postcard. Uh, it's a straight shooting message from an old apostle to a dear friend of his. In fact, he calls him right there in the first verse his beloved friend, Gaius. But uh, within this little short letter here, we meet three interesting characters. Uh, three men who teach us something about what it means and what it does not mean to be a disciple of Christ and to be a servant of Christ within the context of a local church. Two of them are close friends, or at least dear friends of John. One is a fraud, not a friend at all. He's an enemy. But when I think about that, it makes me ask myself, what kind of character am I? Now, if you know me very well, you know I'm a strange character in some ways. I have my quirks, you know. But when it comes to spiritual character and testimony, what kind of a character would people say of me? I'll come back to that thought in a moment. But let's meet the first individual here. His name is Gaius. I call him Gaius the Servant. 
Now, you've already read the text here, but I'll just run through it one more time. Verse 1, the elder to beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I am glad, was very glad when the brethren came and testified to your truth. That is how you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than this than to hear my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that they may be fellow workers with the truth. Aren't you glad we're not on a picnic today? <laughs> by the sound of things outside there. Hopefully that will pass. Well, there are several men in the Bible that are named Gaius, uh, at least in the New Testament. I'm not going to take the time to chase those down and figure out who this one is. It doesn't really matter. But from the way John writes, it seems that this particular Gaius occupied some sort of position of leadership within the church. Maybe he was a pastor, perhaps an elder, maybe a deacon. But John knew him on a personal level, which indicates that Gaius may also have come to know Christ under John's ministry, because John refers to him as one of his beloved children. That's the way the New Testament writers sometimes refer to those who were saved under their service or their ministry. Uh, Paul calls Timothy, my son in the faith. And I think that's the relationship maybe John and Gaius had together. But he's walking in the truth. The truth, we know, consists of what the scriptures declare about Jesus Christ, who he, who he is, who he was, what he accomplished for our redemption, as well as the doctrines that the apostles established for the church. That whole thing embodies what we call the truth. Now, John says several things about Gaius that are worthy of noting, but also worthy of imitating. For one thing, Gaius was spiritually healthy, he mentions in verse 2. So John seems to indicate here that Gaius' physical health will be as prosperous as his spiritual health. His physical health, his spiritual health. Now, I don't know if John is suggesting here that Gaius may have had some physical health problems. It's possible. But he was at his peak in spiritual health. And so that indicates that a person can be very healthy spiritually, but not so healthy physically. Now, when it comes to physical health, it's not always our fault. Uh, some people do damage their health because of bad personal choices and some bad moral habits. But for the most part, when we are afflicted with illness, it's not our fault. Uh, our bodies are still under the curse, and uh, we still are subjected to ailments and disease and so on. So a person can be unhealthy physically, but still very healthy spiritually. And that's the goal that we have. But the main point here is that Gaius was a great model of spiritual health and maturity. And thereby he earned the love and the respect of the church as well as that of John. Now then, verses 3 and 4, you'll note that he maintained a good testimony. John says he had heard from others who came to him with reports of the respect Gaius earned because of his consistent walk with the Lord. Now when I think about that, as I was putting this together, I had to stop and pause and, and wonder what is the reputation that I have or that we have First of all, in the church. What is our reputation in the church? And then what is our reputation outside the church? What testimony would others give if they were asked to evaluate your spiritual character or my spiritual character? Now, I know what I can think about myself and say, pretty good, I'd say. But others might say, no, I don't. I can, I can list here where you've gone wrong and, and, and everything else. Apparently, I do have some imperfections, I guess. I, I was so glad when you honored Mrs. Lavender. 
as a pastor's wife because I know from experience uh, uh, my wife of course is a pastor's wife she grew up in a pastor's home so her mother was a pastor's wife and and so uh, very familiar with the challenges that they face and one of the things that I've learned this is not what I intended to talk about but I just want to throw this in is that very often when people have a gripe against the pastor they'll go through the pastor's wife you know I don't know why they do that but uh, I can tell you this there are a lot of things my wife never told me stuff that people have said or complained about she just didn't pass it on to me and I've been blessed with a with a with a secretary at church that guards me pretty well too and if there's a nasty note that comes through the mail I don't see it well, anyway, I, I, I do appreciate the fact that you're giving that honor and respect to Mrs. Lavender. God bless you, ma'am. But, you know, I, when it comes to evaluating other people's spiritual character, one of the things that, that I get uh, asked to do very often is to be a reference for somebody. Like this happens quite a bit. Uh, either somebody applying for a job or they're applying to be admitted to a Christian college or... A, work at a camp and they say, would you pastor would you be a reference for me here and yeah I will and I'll I don't always know them that well but but I I, I do want them to know that I'm going to be honest I'm not going to lie for you well I did on that evaluation for pastor lavender of his preaching but that that's another story but uh, <laughs> no I didn't I didn't that was good but it, but the real challenge was I had to pay attention I have a tendency to daydream, you know, even I can be sitting under the best preacher in the world and my mind tends to wander. That's how I had trouble in school and I spent two years in fifth grade and that was a big reason. I was looking out the window most of the time the first year, but uh, the second year I was in the hallway most of the time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when, when I have to fill out a reference for somebody and then they ask me to, to evaluate their spiritual character, and sometimes I just have to write on the form, I don't know. I only see this young person in the context of church, and when I see them here, they seem to be behaving pretty well. I don't know what they are outside the church. So I just have to be honest. And there have been a few times where I could not check excellent or very good. The highest they got was good. But, you know, if others were to evaluate us, what would... What would be their evaluation? Well, let's move on, because time's getting away from me, and uh, I hate it when I have to give an intermission in the middle of a sermon, you know? But uh, it happens. <clears throat> Verses 5 through 7, he was hospitable. He was hospitable. See, this is a very important service in that day for believers, and a ministry for the church, because... Those are the days of the early church. The church was just getting started. It was still a new thing. And for the gospel to spread, they often had these itinerant teachers and preachers and, and missionaries who would travel from town to town uh, teaching the, the truth, uh, spreading the gospel. And when they came to these towns where the churches were, they needed a place to stay. But they didn't have the numerous motels and hotels like we had. They usually had an inn, but the inns in those days were seedy at best. Many of them were more like brothels. And so it just was not a good, healthy, or safe place for these visitors to stay. So they relied on people in the local church to welcome them and open their homes to them. But to, to help them in that regard, because they were strangers, these individuals would carry with them letters of reference from their home church that would vouch for their character so they would know that it's time you can, you can let this person in your home and everything will be fine. Now, you know, just like then it is today, you have to be careful who you let into your home. There are people with bad intentions that want to get inside your house. Now, there are people that are scammers, too. And some people are just salespeople who want to sell you junk and uh, they have a slick way of doing it. I remember years ago when it was early in our marriage and we were we were poor <laughs> and uh, 
My wife got a phone call. Some guy wanted to come and present this vacuum cleaner demonstration. It was called the Rainbow Vacuum Cleaner. I don't know if they're still around. It was a good vacuum cleaner, but the reason my wife accepted the, the appointment was because you would get a free box of Tide laundry detergent if you just listened to the demonstration. So she figured we can do that because we need the detergent. That guy was in our house all afternoon trying to sell us that vacuum cleaner. He, we told him over and over again, we don't have the money, we can't afford this thing. It's a wonderful product, but we don't have the money. And he kept changing the, the offer and all these different uh, payment plans. He got on the phone twice with his supervisor, and then he had me talk to the supervisor, and I just said, no, we can't buy this thing. And we finally got him out of the house. But uh, I told my wife, never again. I don't know, care if they're giving away a free car. <laughs> don't let them in. You know? If they want to drop the car off, fine. But, you know, a laundry detergent doesn't last. I don't think it lasted as long as he was in the house. You know? <laughs> but where was I here? <clears throat> well, verse 6 uh, John urges Gaius to do even more in this regard. He was very welcoming. He treated these people well, but he says you could do even more in this regard. Do what? Just go the extra mile. You know, maybe tuck a little spare food in their bag or give them a little money to help with their needs that they have. Well, I guess the lesson here we find in verse 8 is that we should be equally as generous as well. And I have no doubt that you folks in this church are very generous people. And uh, in my church, they're, they're good folks too. I got to say that because some people in my church are here. But, uh, but they're, they're generous people. You know, but when you think of missionaries, there are a lot of missionaries who've sacrificed a lot to serve the Lord. And therefore, we ought to support them because of their fellow workers in the gospel, as, as John says at the end of verse 8. But I realize, too, that not everyone is called to be a foreign missionary. You're not all called to leave home and, and to go somewhere else to be a missionary or a pastor or in some other way. But we all share a part in the support of their ministry. Uh, you've often heard the church referred to as we're like an army. Not that we're armed and we're going to destroy things and blow things up, but we're either we're... We're soldiers in the sense that some folks are positioned on the front lines. Others are in the supply lines. And if they don't have the people that are faithful in the supply lines, they're not going to last on the front lines. And so when it comes to the ministry of the gospel, there are some people who are called to leave their homes and their families, and go to distant places and strange places. But not everybody can do that. Got to, there has to be people back home here that take on the support. There has to be people who stay here and write the checks and uh, pray for these folks and open their homes when they come back for their home ministry assignments. But all of us are needed, every one of us. Now, I would say that because I know that Bible Baptist Church has not succeeded for 51 years without the dedicated service of so many people. I mean, here you are still preaching the gospel and still doing the Lord's work, but I think you all know that you're building on the foundation that was laid by people a long time ago. But you're carrying on that work, and that's the admirable thing. And we want to see that continue on in the years that are ahead as you build for the future. But, you know, some of us may not be able to write huge checks, but we can do something. We can use whatever time or talent or resources God has given to us for the sake of the ministry through the local church. And so if you want a good character to emulate, Gaius is your guy. He's the prime goal to strive for. But as we move into verse 9, we discover that John's tone changes quite dramatically as he talks about a second character that is not a model anyone should imitate. His name is Diotrephes. I call him Diotrephes the Dragon. I base that on a book that uh, Brother Ron Wood gave me a number of years ago, recommended to me. It was, the title of it was Well-Intentioned Dragons. Uh, he came across that book as, when he was pastoring, I think, and had a 
a dragon guy in his church that was giving him trouble, and I think I might have been dealing with something like that or just starting to, but it was a great book, Well-Intentioned Dragons, you know, indicating that these people are well-intentioned sometimes, but they don't know how destructive they are. Diotrephes was a dragon in the, this church. Now, whether he was well-intentioned or not, I don't know. It doesn't seem like he was very well-intended. But verse 9 says, Paul, or John says, when I, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Now, this guy, I don't know where, who he is, but if he, was he a leader in the church? Or just some great influential guy in the church that people listen to? But he's the polar opposite of Gaius. Now, he was a problem, obviously, to Gaius, but he was also a problem to John. And when you note the things that John says to him, and I'll deal with these in a little bit more detail, but he puts himself first. He doesn't respect authority. He talks trash. He's inhospitable. And he runs people out of the church. This is weird. Now, how does a guy get to that position? A number of years ago, I read a book... Uh, I can't remember what the title of it was, but uh, the author of the book had, was, had done a survey of a uh, number of churches around the country, and he had contacted these churches and asked for a copy of their flow chart, their organizational flow chart. You know, every organization, every church has one. We don't always pay attention to it, but, you know, it's got, you know, got Jesus, I hope, at the head, and then you got the pastor, and who is the fourth of the Trinity, and then you got... Uh, <laughs> You got your, your deacons or your elders, and then all the way down it flows and like that. Well, he said he got one, and all, what it was, it was, was a sh one sheet of paper, just a normal sheet of paper, had a big circle. And inside that circle were dots, just filling that circle up. And then right in the center of that circle was the name Ralph. That was their flow chart, according to this person's assessment. Now, what does that tell you? Those little dots represented the congregation. Everything revolved around Ralph. So I'm assuming that Ralph's the guy that made all the decisions. If you're going to do anything, it's got to get by Ralph. I don't think Ralph is the pastor. But it's a terrible way to run a church. <laughs> well, when you think of Diotrephes, or Ralph, what makes a guy like this tick? Well, let's examine his character. For one thing, we're told he, he's guilty of selfish ambition. He desires to be first. I'm the main guy. I don't think he was the pastor. Obviously, if he was, he was a horrible one. But personal ambition and self-promotion, they lie at the root of many church problems. And John knew from personal experience, he had heard Jesus rebuke the Pharisees and the scribes who were so arrogant and put themselves first. And he heard when Jesus said to them in Matthew 23, verse 11 and 12, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Now we'll come back to that thought later. But just remember that large egos and bad attitudes are a bad mix, and they wreak havoc in any church, in any organization for that matter. Amen. And a church's future is in jeopardy when a diatrophies gets into a position of strong influence. Well, second, he had disrespect for authority. Now, John says there that in verse 9, he had previously written a letter to the church. His mistake was he addressed it to the church. 123 Elm Street, wherever this was. Well, Diotrephes intercepted the letter. He must have been the guy that goes through the mail. And so he refused to acknowledge John's authority by ignoring the letter. He may even, 
you can even run it through the shredder. So nobody saw it. But whatever happened, the effect was he rejected the instructions given by John. And this is probably why John sent this second letter directly to Gaius, not addressing it to the church so Diotrephes wouldn't get his filthy hands on it. But can you imagine the gall of Diotrephes to openly reject the authority of an apostle of Jesus Christ? Who does the guy think he is? The only explanation I can think of is that he may have been jealous of John's authority. And in his arrogance and thinking he's such a great guy, he just felt he was more important than John. Jealousy, that's a, that's a bad thing. Now, I've got to confess to you, though. I remember when you first finished this building. I have to take a drink before I confess my sins. <laughs> but I remember after you built this building, I stopped in to see Kevin, to see your building, and Kevin gave me a, a tour of, of the facility that you had or have. I think you've added to it since then. But uh, I got a little jealous. Not, not in a sinful way, but when I saw the, the baptistry changing rooms that you have back here, they're like locker rooms. <laughs> awesome. All we have are these two little tiny closets. They're about this big right here. You get three people in there changing to get baptized. You can picture the scene, what that's like. So I have to, when I have a group of people, I got to do half of them at the beginning of the service and half at the end of the service. You know, so it's just a horrible setup. They, when, whoever built our building back then, they just, they did a, just a dreadful job in some areas. But, um, I, you know, I was walking around just admiring. You got everything, <laughs> you know. But, you know, while I say I'm jealous, I'm also very, very thankful because God, when God blesses a good church, I like to see that. You know, when God blesses a bad church, I don't think it's God's blessing, but... I know you folks deserve it well. I know the time you spent down there in, in the old Calvary building downtown. And, uh, but uh, you, you stayed with it, and what God has done through you has been just tremendous, so I commend you for that. But, uh, you know, one source I read said that the name Diotrephes was actually an uncommon name back then, that it was only found in wealthy families, families of prestige, so if you had a kid named Diotrephes, he got beat up at school a lot, probably. But, <clears throat> but, you know, that may have been at the root of his behavior. That he may have, may have been the reason he was appointed to a position of leadership or influence in the church because of his wealth and his prestige. Now, I can't say that for sure. I'm just speculating here. But... At the same time, that is a good lesson for any church. Never place a person in position of leadership or influence because they are wealthy or influential in the community, prestigious. The church should be a place where all social and economic distinctions don't matter. And I've told my church many times that we are all on the same level. When we come through the doors and enter this building, we check everything at the door. It doesn't matter what your job is, what your income is, how high you are in the community, if you're Republican or a Democrat or what you are. We're all equal. We're on the same level here. We're all sinners saved by grace and who need his grace every day of our lives. Well, another thing about Diotrephes, he's a malicious gossip in verse 10 accusing us of wicked words. It's awful. It means that they, they were saying things that were malignant and false about John and his partners in ministry. That's why I call him a trash talker. You know, you hear about trash talking in sports, right? You know, on the basketball court and the football field. And I was not an athlete, so I don't know what trash talking's about, but... Uh, <clears throat> I hang around Ron Wood a lot, so I know what trash talking's like. No, I'm kidding, brother. I love you. I love you. I'll, I'll buy you coffee in the morning. Uh, 
But you know, in a football field, they're getting ready to snap the ball, and you're across the line from another guy, and just before the ball snapped, you know, you say, yeah, you see your girlfriend sitting up there with another guy in the bleachers. <laughs> what? Bam! <laughs> well, this is bad stuff that this guy is doing, spreading malicious, false things about, you know, apostle. But you know, the thing about gossip is it doesn't have to be flat-out lies. Gossip can include half-truths. It can include exaggerations of something that might have some truth to it. It includes innuendo, just implying or dropping little words to plant a seed of question. Anything that discredits another person. Now today we have to deal with what they call fake news, you know. And uh, there's just a lot of that going on. That's the trouble with social media. So you got to be really careful about the stories you read and the reports that you read because they probably aren't true or they're exaggerated. So always verify you know, the political messages from reliable sources. But why did Diotrephes treat the Apostle John so viciously? Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, it may have been jealousy of John's authority. But I think what really happens is jealousy turns to bitter resentment. And that's, that's a terrible thing. Now, I'm not in the habit of quoting celebrities, but once in a while, if they come out with something good, I guess I can quote them. But I read a while back that the late Carrie Fisher, uh, actress, uh, she made a correct statement. She said, resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Because that's really what it is. Resentment eats away at our joy. It's a cancer that, that has to be removed from the premises of our hearts. Resentment caused Cain to kill Abel, caused Saul to try to kill David. And so I would just say, if you are harboring any amount of resentment toward another person, confess it to God right away and let him wash that poison from your heart before it destroys you. But what if you're the victim? Somebody else is gossiping about you or, or trying to destroy your reputation. Well, first of all, don't retaliate with venomous words of your own. That only escalates the tension. It ramps things up and pours gasoline on an already smoldering fire. I received some great advice from another preacher several years ago on how to respond to gossip, um, especially people in your church, if that happens. <laughs> he said to, to reply like Nehemiah did when he had some enemies that were after him. Remember, they were trying to build the walls, and he had these two guys named Sanballat and Tobiah, Tobiah rather, and they were spreading bad things about Nehemiah trying to halt the work. Well, there's a response that Nehemiah gave. I'll give you the reference in a moment. But this pastor said this is, this is the way he responds when he hears that somebody's saying something negative or false about him. He said, just give them Nehemiah 6, verse 8. You don't have to write it out. You don't have to, to type it out in an email. Just give them the reference, Nehemiah 6, 8, and let them look it up on their own. And this is what it says. Then I sent a message to him saying, such things as you are saying have not been done, but you are inventing them in your own mind. That's all I need to know. <laughs> <clears throat> well, Diotrephes, our old friend here, was not content with disrespect or self-promotion or a campaign of gossip. He also had an unwelcoming spirit. He refused, verse 10, to welcome these outsiders, these itinerant preachers. Now, I don't know why, Apparently, maybe he felt that the arrival of other preachers or teachers would threaten his own position. That maybe they might like him better than, or like this guest but rather than they like him. Now, obviously, Kevin wasn't concerned about me coming here. That was going to be no threat to him. But, <laughs> but I've known guys like that. They're, they're very guarded, and they don't want anybody else coming in. Now, that can work both ways, too. I invite other preachers in that I know are going to make me look good. No, I don't do that, but uh, when they do, I feel better. But, uh, but no, we, we can't be territorial about the pulpit when someone's preaching the Word of God. 
Now, regardless of the possible benefit of the church in hearing other teachers, Diotrephes obviously was determined to protect his own position at all costs. More concerned about his own glory, his own name, than the name of Christ. There's one final flaw we've got to mention here about his character, and that was abuse of authority. Not only did he refuse to let these itinerant teachers and preachers come into his church or lift a finger to help them, anyone in the church who tried to do that, he had them kicked out of the church. I don't know how he got that kind of authority. Now, if it's the same church that Gaius is in, obviously Gaius wasn't a victim of that. He was probably scared of Gaius, but just the same, to run people out of the church because they're doing something good. Now, let me just mention here, <clears throat> some of you may be in your past, in another place, have had a bad experience in a church. Maybe you've encountered church leaders, or maybe even a pastor who was self-centered, divisive, power-hungry dictator, even spiritually abusive. I have heard of those cases where there were pastors of churches, and usually they're small churches, but they are in a position there, they're the little dictator, and they spiritually abuse people. That's disgrace. Well, thank the Lord that you've never been subjected to that here, and uh, you never will, I trust. But unfortunately, in a stagnant pond, the scum floats to the top. I know it's a lousy analogy, but the only one I could think of at the time. But Verse 11, John makes a very bold statement against Diotrephes. He said, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. You know what he's saying? He's saying Diotrephes is doing evil, and he's not even a believer. This guy's not a Christian. Don't imitate what this man does. Well, there's one other person, and this is a good guy. Two on a three are good. Verse 12, I call him Demetrius the example. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. You know, this wonderful Christian man only gets one verse. Diotrephes got a bunch of stuff said about him. Gaius got several verses, but Demetrius only gets one. But this one verse tells us everything we know to, need to know about his godly example and his respected Christian testimony. Now, we, we may not all rise to the level of Gaius, but we can all be like Demetrius. Two things about him. Number one, he received a good testimony. This means he was well spoken of, and John he as well says he's well spoken of by everyone. <laughs> Nobody has a bad thing to say about Demetrius. Now, I will add that that's, that's not always a good thing in a certain context. Jesus said back in Luke 6, verse 26, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Now, that's a whole different context, though. That's being spoken well of by people who shouldn't be speaking well of you. <laughs> the enemies of Christ. If they're patting you on the back and telling you what a great guy you are, then you're probably not doing something right. <laughs> But Demetrius, in his case, it was good because Demetrius walked according to God's truth and he received a good report from faithful believers in the church. And second, he embodied the truth. He lived it. He took his faith in the word of God seriously. And John added his own affirmation here. We add our testimony and you know that our testimony is true. That's to say, when we speak well of somebody, you know we're not stretching the truth, and we don't say anything if it's not true. Now, just a, a couple of questions to ponder here as we move toward a, a wrap-up here. First of all, who do you imitate? Who do you want to imitate? You know, many times we all have people who are our, quote, heroes, unquote, 
Dr. Warren Wearsby was one of my heroes, now with the Lord. But people we would like to emulate. The question is, is this person a godly person? Is he or she someone we should be like or someone we should avoid? Second, who do you surround yourself with? Who are your friends, your colleagues? What's the group or the crowd or the gang that you want to be identified with? Is this group a group that's going to make you better? Or are they going to bring you down? So let's just be sure that we're aligning ourselves with the right people and realize that God is calling us to be a good example to others. And that we should be the kind of people that have a character that help, <laughs> helps people become better, that draws them to Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to say something here then in connection with this about our role as servants. We're all servants of Jesus Christ, whether we believe it or not. <clears throat> and John learned this personally from Jesus. You remember the time when he and his brother John, young disciples, were walking with Jesus, and they asked him this weird question. Would you grant it that we would be able to sit one on your right hand, one on your left hand of your throne in glory? Now, I don't know what gave them the idea that they were so deserving of that honor above all the other disciples, but Jesus was quick to correct them. In Mark chapter 10, at verse 43, he said, But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Servant. You know, there are myriads of books that are on the Christian market today, and even in the secular market, on leadership how to be a good leader, and I've read a number of them through the years, and uh, how to be a good leader. Here are eight things you have to do to be a good leader in your church. Or here are five things that every leader must do to be successful. Uh, here are 12 things that every leader must do to get your church to grow, and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, when I cleaned out my library recently, I got rid of all those books, <laughs> except uh, there's just two of them that I kept that that were good, and I'll tell you one of them in a moment. <clears throat> but it may surprise you, but the term leader is seldom used in the Bible, at least as a title given to someone. In fact, in the King James Version, the term leader only appears six times. Much more frequently, the word servant is used in reference specifically to people who are used of God to do his work. Moses, my servant. The apostles, uh, very often their, their letters would identify themselves as servants of Jesus Christ, slaves of Jesus Christ. Now, servant is not a typical role that we seek out or, and, and assume because in the world, the title servant conjures up images of low prestige, low respect, low honor. But whenever Jesus used the word servant, it was always synonymous with greatness. Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, Galatians 5.13, serve one another in love. And that includes leaders. Servant leader is the title that we should have. Now, one of the books I kept is one I've read several times. I gave it to my board a couple times to read through. It's a book by J. Oswald Sanders, and the title is Spiritual Leadership. And I like the title. It's not about the mechanics of leadership or the organizational aspects of it and all of that mumbo-jumbo. It's how to be a spiritual leader. And he gets right to the heart of what every spiritual leader must expect and do. I want to re read for you a paragraph uh, excerpt from <clears throat> his book. <clears throat> he said, at the outset of any study of spiritual leadership, this master principle must be squarely faced. True greatness, true leadership is found in giving yourself in service to others. 
not coaxing or inducing others to serve you. True service is never without cost. Often it comes with a painful baptism of suffering. But the true spiritual leader is focused on the service he and she can render to God and other people, not on the residuals and perks of high office or holy title. Now, I know you have in Pastor Lavender a servant leader. He wouldn't be here as long as he has been, and this church wouldn't be blessed the way it has been blessed without that. And the same for Pastor Butler who preceded him. But I would say to you that if God has called you to be a leader in any level within the church, do it. But do it with humility. Do it with a servant's heart. Seek to bring glory to God, not to yourself. And that will make the disappointments and the failures and the difficulties easier to handle. And it will keep the successes in proper perspective. Now, why do I share all this servant stuff? Well, I share it because I care about this church. I want to see Bible Baptist Church thrive in the years to come. It was so, I was so delighted, not just entertained, but to, to see that video of those, those boys being taught how to serve communion. It was cute, but it, there's a strong message there, too, because I, I see a lot of young people here in the church, and you're the future of this church. You know, those of you who are, are serving this church today, you, as I said, you've, you're building on the foundation that was already laid 51 years ago and through the years of generations of people who came and, and served this church and passed the baton on to others. And for you young people, the baton is going to be passed on to you. And you will have the responsibility to build for your future and to make sure that you're maintaining the, the truth of God's word that's been proclaimed here all through these generations. And so as you build for the future, seek to gain a good report like that of Gaius and Demetrius so that you will be known as a shining example in this community of Christian people who love and serve Jesus and love and serve one another. Well, God bless you, and thank you again for this great opportunity to, to speak the word of God to you. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Father, what a joy it's been to fellowship and to worship together and uh, to, to just be able to experience the, the process of worship in a, another church, another context, and with people who love you and desire to come and worship you. And, so thank you for what we've enjoyed today. Thank you for Bible Baptist Church and for how you've guided and blessed them through the years and for the pastoral leadership and their wives who have been so faithful to you. And I pray as they build for the future that things will continue to be just as strong, just as dynamic, and that your Holy Spirit would have the power to work in this church and move lives and your name will be glorified for as long as you give us here until we hear that trumpet sound and you call us forth. And this I pray in our Savior's name. Amen. <laughs>